Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 27, our penultimate episode of the season actually. Um, so I'm joined by, well myself, we got Sam and we got Jackson. You've joined, joined yeah, by yourself. Yeah, I joined myself, <laughs> <laughs> me, myself and I. Um, so on today's show guys, we're going to hand it over to Sam to do a bit of industry news, bring us up to speed with everything film. And um, then Sam had the pleasure of actually interviewing Ashley Turner, who is a film creative herself based in America. She's, uh, well, she runs a company called Gorilla Girls. Um, so we'll put a link in the description so you can check out some of her content and stuff. And then we're also going to be doing our, our monthly horror discussion. This month, it is meant to be for August, but as it's the last second to last episode, we decided to bring it forward a little bit and we're going to be discussing zombies. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. So there have been mass delays in films this week. The, the thing that was guaranteed to happen, happened. Tenet is moved off the schedule. Mulan is moved off the schedule. Top Gun 2 is moved to July. Quiet Place is back in March. What, next July? Yeah. Oh, flip. And this was to be expected. Some of these films, obviously, like the smaller genre fit picks, they're going to go straight out to like um, the VOD sites because there's so many out there now. I, I feel like there's a lot of people talking about the year of film is over in 2020. And it really is very ignorant because there's loads of independent films still coming out. Mm. And if anything, it gives you an opportunity to go, wow, we're gonna have a great blockbuster year next year. Let's pay attention to smaller films. And let's not forget like Netflix have still got their whole entire Oscar season all shot and ready to go by the end of the year. So there's still more to enjoy with film basically. Just we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer for the more films people genuinely were really excited about. And it's probably going to happen with Bond. Bond is probably going to get moved to summer next year. It's going to be a bloodbath in the summer. It's supposed to be November, wasn't it? It got pushed too. Yeah, there's talks of it moving again. Oh. So we'll see. We'll see. Randomly, this I just thought this was interesting news. And like, if I feel it's like one of those things that you can easily mock. But if you think about the creative people behind it, it might be good. Dave Franco, James Franco's brother, is going to play Vanilla Ice. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> So, it, yeah, yeah, you, it, the thing is, Dave Franco just recently directed his first film, The Rental, which uh, I believe is out on VOD, and is a horror thriller. So I'm kind of like, all right, the guys, the thing is, the Franco family have got a lot of bad stuff and good stuff, but they're going for more of an approach like Disaster Eyes with this film. And of course, you know, like, that did so well. And it's a blacklisted script. And obviously, the blacklist is the, um, not blacklisted, it's on the blacklist script. The Blacklist script is essentially the list of the best scripts of years. So yeah, it looks like it could be better than what it sounds, basically. And I like Dave Franco. He's got likability. And Vanilla Ice, when you look at them, they look kind of similar. And he can act. So I don't know. Like, I feel like it should go more of a mockery because the guy, Vanilla Ice has got a lot of ups and downs. But it could be interesting. So we'll see. Yeah. Edgar Wright, he just can't stop signing up to films. Literally, I believe the last few times I've done industry news, I've announced a new Edgar Wright film. <laughs> but here's another one. He's uh, signed to do the film called Stage 13. And Stage 13 is a feel-good ghost movie about an actor who meets an old silent actor who's now a ghost. And they try to work out how they can both do something positive. Which uh, eh, sounds interesting. I preferred the fact that he was going more into a darker place, but he seems to... He, Clearly, this time is giving him a lot of time to go, I'm going to do this more He's definitely projects. been doing a lot of writing during lockdown. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing is, if you think about Edgar Wright's career, like he's had a lot of points where he's not had the opportunity to make a film. Because he got screwed over with Ant-Man. And that was like eight years of his life developing that. And he's been screwed over quite a few times, but then Baby Driver made a lot of money. So this film as well, like, I think this gives you an exact idea of what kind of film this is going to be. It's produced by Amblin Movies. If you know who Amblin movies are, they're the guys who do E.T. It's one of Spielberg's companies. So you get a vibe of, okay, it's going to be one of those kind of films. And I feel like Edgar Wright has been pushing towards doing an 80s feel good, but still good for the adults and kids film for a long time. And I'm, I'm open to it. I hate those kind of films, but I really love every, everything that Edgar Wright's done. How can you hate them kind of films? Because I have no soul and I have no heart. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that from living with you. But... <laughs> and to finish on an, on an independent level there are lots of Indiegogos around at the moment and a few of our friends are doing some so <clears throat> there's this film called Callback from Horror Screen Vaults and Foxtrot Productions 
Uh, Horror Screen Vaults do brilliant things for the independent community. They, they, they do a lot of reviews and blogs and just give a good showcase to a lot of international talent. Also, they do a quiz once, uh, once a week for charity for the NHS. Check that out. But this film's going to star uh, Jen Nangle, who um, was in that gore theater. And uh, it's full of like horror icons, like lots of horror icons, like Eileen Dites, who played the, um, oh God, I can never remember this bloody demon's name, <laughs> the demon from The Exorcist. <laughs> and they're looking for those sort of actors and they're getting a lot of attention. It's going well so far. So we're going to put the link, you have probably seen it on the screen right now. Please check that out. And the other film is more, uh, it's closer to us because we work with them on quite a lot recently. And it's a Daisy Hills production. Uh, it's Follow Me Down. It's a British gangster film, and that's on Greenlit. And I'm like, they're doing so well, like, so quickly with that, and I'm so yeah. happy for them. Abby is a tour de force when it comes to work attitude and creativity, so um, I'm hoping anyone can support them. Yeah. So please check out those uh, campaigns, and don't worry about the fact that you're not going to get all your big mainstream movies this year. Support some independent ones. Yeah, nicely put, Sam. Um, Earlier on this week, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Ashley Turner, who is an American filmmaker who has her own company called Gorilla Girls. Um, and actually, we kind of became quite close with Ashley during lockdown. We kind of were chatting and we got to know her and stuff. And uh, she's really well, a big fan of the stuff we do. And we're very positive and like the stuff that she does. And now we kind of have this collaboration. And Sam basically got speaking to her during the week. So over to you, Sam. Take it away. I'm on Trash Out's Take with Ashley Turner from Gorilla Girl Films. How are you doing? You good? Yeah, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's obviously a lot later because, was it, eight hour difference where you are? Yeah, I think uh, it's only two o'clock where I'm at, so I'm not sure what time it is for you guys over there. Yeah, I think it's just past ten. Wow. Well, well, thank you for uh, taking me at such a late hour. <laughs> it's no problem. So what got you into filmmaking? Well, I have always been a fan of film, um, specifically the horror genre. That's always been near and dear to my heart. I grew up watching that. I was kind of that unusual kid that, you know, age six or seven, I'm checking out from the video store all of the horror films. My mom obviously enabled that. And it just, uh, the storytelling aspect and how you can tell the human condition and everything through it really always had my attention. And as I was growing up, I was really into storytelling, writing, and it wasn't until later in life that I actually got into filmmaking. So probably my late 20s is when I actually ventured in and decided to take that step into filmmaking and go from writing to the actual film process. So what was uh, some of your first film projects? Oh, let's see. I actually started, what was interesting is in order to learn everything about the filmmaking process, I wanted to try each role in okay. terms of, you know, gaffer, PA, assistant camera, everything, anything and everything I could get my hands on. So the best way to do that, I actually interned for a while at a local television station and they were pretty relaxed because it was a small local station. So I was able to actually practice on various shows of theirs. And it got to the point where they would send me packed up with like a full camera bag, sound, all of the stuff to go run interviews for them at different, you know, uh, companies, different restaurants, stuff like that, mm. and run small interviews. And then I started working on like little documentaries and it just, it spiraled from there into more projects. <laughs> That's fantastic. And um, so w when you started doing that kind of thing, what were like the roles that you, you found more, I guess, um, like in the natural ability with? I think because I tend to be very into the humanity aspect of things, like the human emotion, the mm. human condition, I find that I do well with evoking emotions out of people. So I kind of gravitated a lot to the directing portion because, you know, I had an idea of what I wanted to evoke from people and 
could finesse it out of them. So I really enjoyed directing and I was able to get actors to, or even if it wasn't acting, whether it's a documentary, I could create a rapport with the person that I was working with and get them to relax and tell their story. Or as I transition more into narrative and, you know, the fiction side of the house, I was able to pull out what emotions we wanted from those characters. And so I really enjoyed the directing side of the house, but I also really enjoy producing. So the organization, the contracts, the legalities, I actually like <laughs> like finding insurance and stuff like that. So um, those are some of the roles I really enjoyed. So when did you st- still enjoy Oh, sorry. So when, so when did you um, start Gorilla Girls Films? I started Gorilla Girl Productions in 2015. And uh, that was born out of... I mean, it's Gorilla, so G-U-E, Gorilla, not, you know, not the primate, and (laughs) some people think it's the primate, and it's just like, no, that's that's not where that comes from. (laughs) It was actually born out of this idea that independent filmmaking oftentimes is Gorilla filmmaking. We are figuring out, yeah, we're figuring out how to get the shot we need within the budget that we can, sometimes with no budget, and within the resources that we're able to get and being creative about finding resources we don't have. And so it it really is this idea of independent filmmaking is guerrilla filmmaking. And, you know, I used to joke about my filmmaking. It's not asking for forgiveness or permission. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) just, just, I don't know if that's the best thing, but that's just how I approached it. We, we get it done within safe, you know, safety, of course, but I know, especially when I was filming in Utah horror films, it is a very, um, religious state, and so certain things that, like, filming in a cemetery is a really big no-no for them, and not legally, but just philosophically, and so for me, it's like getting in there, filming in cemeteries, they're filming content that they don't necessarily agree with, and, you know, not being apologetic for it because we're telling a story and we're telling a story that means something. Even if that story is a fun, silly horror, it still, it still means something. It's still speaking to something within us. And yeah. so, yeah. And so the, just that idea of creating Gorilla Girl was creating an independent film company that represents that notion of, filmmaking and getting the story out and doing it with however you need to get it out, whether it's no budget, low budget, whatever, making that story happen, but also doing it well. So, so cause as you were saying, you've got a love for horror. Is there any particular mm-hmm. part of horror that you kind of like drift towards in the storytelling that you want to tell? I think a lot of my horror tends to gravitate towards the psychological horror and so whether that manifest in serial killer or um, the hauntings being you know being haunted by whether it be a ghost demon something because those are representations of something within us oftentimes being told through those supernatural characters stuff like that I do love though not necessarily making them but I do enjoy a good monster flick (laughs) (laughs) and uh, I, I have a soft spot for monster monster flicks. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, so how we met? We met obviously through a uh, Trapped Film Festival, which you started towards the beginning of um, the COVID nineteen outbreak. And um, That's correct. yeah, it's, uh, tell us a bit about that because obviously this is something that you from the, from what I get you and you wanted to like do nonetheless as another side to Gorilla Films is offering a film festival. Am I right in that regards? Yeah. And so I, I have an editor that I work with consistently. He's phenomenal. And he is my counterpart. He's actually based out of Atlanta, Kevin Wilson. And he and I were talking when co- we actually have a few projects that we've been working on that were supposed to go into production this year, but because of COVID we had to pause it hmm. and see, you know, when are we allowed to film again? And in the meantime, we had been working on finishing up some previous projects of ours and realized that like how many people 
had filmed in 2019, 2018. And we don't know, like the future of film is kind of at an impasse Mm -hmm. in terms of when are we going to be screening our films again or able to, when are we going to be able to show these stories that were burning to be told in the first place. And so he and I had discussed creating an avenue for that for people not only as a morale booster, because we're all, you know, a lot of us creatives, our jobs got put on hold, we got furloughed, we got just, the film industry took a really big hit with the the pandemic, so how can we create kind of hope for our fellow filmmakers, but also celebrate them, because I feel like oftentimes with film festivals, it's show the film, show the film, show the film, which is great, right, that's the whole point, Mm but we sometimes don't get to celebrate the filmmaker themselves and their process and how hard it was, you know, maybe for them because independent film is not easy. And not that, you know, major film is, but when you have a big, bigger budget to work for, you can focus on one person, one role. And in yeah. independent film, it's oftentimes we're carrying like 10 hats. And mm-hmm. so, um, just celebrating the filmmakers and celebrating the films and giving them a place to showcase those films and come together in a sense of community during COVID. Now, eventually, we do want to take this into a more physical realm, but we've discussed it, and it's you know it's probably more of a hybrid because people, how great was it when we were showcasing the films to have on that YouTube platform, the ability to chat and talk to the filmmaker as the film is going. Yeah, and it's, it's such a nice way that, peop- that people have been able to do that. It keeps that community vibe completely. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it makes the audience who maybe aren't filmmakers feel like, oh my gosh, I'm talking to the director or the writer <laughs> or whatever. And But it also is great for the filmmaker because they don't oftentimes get to know how people react to their films, right, Mm. in that moment. And how many times just watching, and I know some people muted the chat because they wanted to just watch the films. But there were some who kept it on and they're like, oh my gosh, that was intense, that was great, the cinematography, the color, wow. And it was fantastic because they get to see swoon if you will they get to just go full forward falling in love with these films and let the filmmakers know and the filmmakers can see it in the moment as it happens they can see people receiving their film and enjoying it and i enjoyed that in our it was oh it was only supposed to be an hour and a half we expected it with it being a first year film fest of this kind that it we may get you know 10 submissions at best and we got over 65, and wow. it was, yeah, international. So we got submissions from everywhere, over 65 of them. And we had a selection committee, you know, parse it down to, to the ones we did. And originally it was supposed to be an hour and a half we slated because we're like, well, you know, it's the first year. We'll see what we get. We had to expand it because there were so many great films that were like, okay, we... <laughs> We'll, we'll expand the time frame. I mean, it's it's not like we're renting out a theater, right? Mm. It's We've got an online platform. What's the longest we can keep people's attention and celebrate these films? And so we expanded it to, I believe it was like two hours and 37 minutes or something like that. And in that two hours and 37 minutes, there was not one single negative remark in that chat. Like, people were enjoying it. People were giving positive feedback to the filmmakers, and the filmmakers were being kind and awesome back. And it was amazing. I loved it. Like, that sense of community we wanted happened, and I was I was so happy. I was so dorky happy. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Because <clears throat> that's, like, the thing is, you've, you've recently kind of, I suppose, expanded upon that with the Exoscripts uh-huh. competition, which I actually think is, like, awesome because cool. you don't see... I mean, you see script competitions, but nothing, mm-hmm. I don't know, nothing that doesn't feel to, I always find script competition very, um, they create a lot of anxiety, because it feels there's more mm-hmm. of an elitism towards what they're expecting from the scripts. Well, mm-hmm. not so much elitism, but like, I suppose more industry standards, whereas obviously film, you yeah. can just create off your own chords, but with a script, mm-hmm. they want to see it in a certain sort of format. But, it, but I, I like the fact that with this competition, it's more, you, you just want to see great stories, I'm, I'm assuming. 
Absolutely. Uh, we, and because I have the background of writing, I, you know, one of my things when we were first creating Trapped, like even before the Film Fest was in place, was what do we want to see this become post-COVID? And it was, to me, because the online platform took off so well, it was like, well, let's potentially make it a hybrid. How cool would it be to be able to, once COVID is maintained and okay, to be able to actually give a physical place people can go to, but maybe like a rotating place, like Trapped Atlanta, Trapped Seattle, Trapped London. I mean, you never know. Mm -hmm. And because we have, as filmmakers, we have such a big community, right? We oftentimes connect across, like you and I, you know, different countries. And using those resources to maybe create a rotating platform, but still maintain that online presence. So maybe create a hybrid somehow of streaming it and a theater screening. Um, so that those that want that experience of going to a film fest and going to a theater to watch those films can, but then those that maybe can't afford to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars doing a film festival circuit run can still enjoy that screening of their film and having people interact with them to discuss that film. Hmm. Um, cause I think oftentimes filmmakers get, I don't want to say forgotten in the process, but they're kind of the last thought and realistically as independent filmmakers, we put our budget and our hopes and dreams into that film. So then when at times it's like, it comes time for that festival run or screening, I mean, now you have for each festival the cost of the entrance, you have the cost to get there if you get in, the cost of staying, and so forth. And so it's like, if we can alleviate that for the filmmaker and still celebrate them, I mean, that's, that's for me, one of my goals. I know Kevin probably has his own goals as well. Um, with the screenwriting, that was one of my goals, is to also incorporate that into mm -hmm. a festival. But I think those, when they're put in conjunction with festivals they get lost. The screenwriting competition gets lost in the mix. So I wanted to have it presented by a Trapped Film Festival, but in its own time frame, so that those writers can be celebrated and their stories can be celebrated as well. So if people wanted to like, because I've recommended this to a few people that I know like um, in our little film community, as it were, because it's like, why not? You want as many more submissions yeah. as possible. How could people submit yeah. if they wanted to? How could they submit? <clears throat> yeah, well, um, basically, oh, you know, pl okay. plug it, plug it away. <laughs> oh, <laughs> plug it away. Thank you. Uh, so there's multiple ways. We, we wanted it to be as screenwriter friendly as possible, or not even screenwriter. It may be a person who this is their first story and they're not quite sure what they're doing, but they have a story they're burning to tell in the horror and sci-fi genre for now. Um they could go to our website, which is the trappedfilmfestival.com, and it's got, you know, easy buttons to download the form, email us your script in a PDF form. But we also have an option on Film Freeway where you can just submit it directly through there and it comes to us. And it's whatever way is easiest for people to submit to us. And Similar to what you're saying, oftentimes when screenwriters submit to screenplay competitions, it's not always like, okay, well, what is this catering to and what am I getting from that? So for us, one of the things we wanted to do was once again repeat what we did with the Trapped Film Festival and not have any entry fee. Like, it, you know, this is just us wanting to celebrate filmmakers and screenwriters at this point in time. And what can we do to make sure it's the easiest process? So it was like, okay, we're not going to do an entry fee because, I mean, that's just not something I wanted to do. And also, what can we do to help in terms of making it an easier process for the screenwriters for the after? Sorry, I lost my thought for a moment there. <laughs> so after, what now is pretty much what it is. What now? So what I wanted to offer people in the feature length category, because short scripts are a bit easier to produce in terms of finances, typically, depending what kind of script it is and um, execution. But for the feature length scripts, I actually wanted to offer 
the winner a pitch book consultation. And some people, especially those new to the world, the filmmaking world, are just like, I don't even know what that is, but it's like, who? that's how you sell your film. <laughs> if you're wanting to keep your film and be part of the production, your pitch book helps you sell it to, mm. to investors and to, to potential investors is pretty much what it is. It's an investor book uh, for your investors. So what I was going, uh, what I am offering in what we are offering with the festivals for the first place winner, actually, you know, they get their prize award money, but they also get a pitch book, pitch book consultation. And that's me pretty much creating a, developing a pitch book with the winner to completely break down their film and make it sellable. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, not their film, their script. And not break it down like change the script, but pull the pieces of it that we need for a pitch book so that they could then turn around and take to an investor. And so that's one of the things that don't typically get offered (laughs) in this kind of contest. But we were trying to look at what is valuable to filmmakers what is valuable to screenwriters and is that something we can offer so i think that's the key word there it is like that's so valuable for filmmakers and it's something that they're not like you said they're not really taking in and a lot of the time i know that you want to create and you don't always think well we need to get money for it you're like well i'll try and create it anyway and sometimes it's good to know that you know there's a little bit more you might be able to get a little bit more you know Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's oftentimes, even if it's a smaller investor, if they see that you've got something as professional put together and thoughtful as a pitch book, they know that you're going to take their investment or their donation, depending on what their goal is, seriously. And you're not just like, woo, blowing the money everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it works like uh, I don't know, it works a lot towards the credibility of the filmmaking team and the image of the production team mm. when you have something professional alongside your script or your concept. And to your point, as filmmakers, we're oftentimes so embedded in our creative brain that we forget those steps. And so that's where people like myself and Kevin come, you know, we, we have our creative brains as well, but we also are like, hey, let's help you get the other side. Mm. <laughs> the productive side, the production side. So, In that regard, like... How can people check out Gorilla Girls Productions work? So, so where where is the platform to be able to see some of your films? Oh my goodness! You know, honestly, I really don't have anything set up in terms of a direct platform with everything I've worked on. A lot of projects I've worked on either have ended up in YouTube or done their festival run Mm. or were part of other people's projects like commercials and stuff like that. I am working this year with Kevin (laughs) to get a real, a full reel put together for myself and updated reel. I will be one of the projects we just finished is a film. I had shot. It's a short film. It's fun. I call it a fun film. It's a horror short. It's fun. It's just, you know, horror for the sake of fun horror with a little bit of human commentary on it. And that's uh, going to be screened this year at some point. I did not want to screen it in Trapped because I didn't want to take from away from the filmmakers that submitted and mm. put their hard work into it. So I am screening that separately. I just don't know where yet. But as soon as that's up, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to watching that. That'd be cool. Yeah, it's uh, called The Better to Taste You With. It's fun. <laughs> nice. So, uh, <clears throat> as a creative, what would be like a, I always ask this question, but like a, a dream project, if you didn't have to consider on a budget level, what would be that great story that you've always wanted to tell? Oh, man. Um, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I... You know, if I had to say, I would split it, there are two, there are two projects. One would be an actual, like, series, an an anthology series that I would like to do, like, anthology series in terms of television, and that I've been working on the development of, and it's, that would be really neat to put into 
to keep creative control over and to produce and execute it out to the world because it's just been a blast working on. But then I also have a feature film that I have been labor of love. I think we all have that one script that just, yup, that just, it's like, you love it and you hate it. And (laughs) I have put so much of myself into it, but I feel like that one is a lot of practical effects that I would love to have an endless budget to execute on. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, like, because I've, I've, I think with TV, there's that you've got, you can really tell a character's story to, to sometimes to a more fuller degree. And we, we try uh-huh. to write like um, TV series and we actually, we have two web series, um, which obviously are TV series, but we try to think of it like it's a TV series. And you do sort of like envision that bigger story and it becomes more of, I suppose, in a weird way, like a more pure ensemble experience because you stay with that family for like three to four years, depending on how long you're doing it. So I can always see uh-huh. that draw towards wanting to, you know, do a series. Yeah, I think, I, I, I like I said, I grew up on the horror aspect of things, including television, and I loved you know, Tells from the Crypt and uh, Twilight Zone and all of the the things like that. And so for me to bring back something that really messes with the human psyche and the element of human nature that just speaks to me and there's so many stories I, I feel like I could fit into that. But I also have like this feature length script for a film that I've been wanting to do and that one it's like I've massaged in terms of what's the lowest budget I can get away with making this what's the highest budget that would make it amazing and really even with that one I wouldn't say that's the highest execution budget in terms of my film style I am very inspired by Hitchcock and a lot more of the I'm only going to show you as much as I need to because I want your imagination to do the rest for me. Um, Because you're going to scare yourself a lot better than I'm going to be able to scare you or make you uncomfortable. So (laughs) I want to kind of guide you into that world and then let you terrify yourself. And um, so it's not so much like special effects and CGI, but those are definitely handy. And when, you know, you can't necessarily truly disembody somebody. So (laughs) (laughs) you kind of need those extra things. And that does, does does have a budget, but I am in love with like cinematography and how people can capture shots that body language, you know, tell such a story. And I am not a great cinematographer, but I can appreciate great cinematography. (laughs) Cinematography is a weird one. Like the first ever film that I ever shot um, was for a, tw- a forty-eight hour film challenge, and I'd never shot a film. This was only about five years ago. Before that, I'd always worked with my various cinematographers, and I was terrified of it. And I was like, "Ah, oh, like you know, I can't. How am I supposed to know all those technical aspects?" But then you just go, "Okay, if it looks right, that's what you want." And I, I won an award <laughs> yeah. for the cinematography, and after that, I felt a lot more confident just to go. I don't need to know every aspect of the camera i just need to know that i'm going to set it up and go right that looks cool get a second eye to double check you know and that's what i love about that was it cool. and you know i agree with you like i can set up a shot i can get the shot i admire the people though that that's in their blood and mm. They look at that same shot and they're like, imagine if you lifted the camera here or you panned around here and then down here. And it's like, oh, oh, that's good. (laughs) So I agree that, you know, being able to get the shot is can be solid and great. But there are just those people that I feel they have that magic and it takes a shot that. I would probably just set up as a wide shot. Like, here we go. We got a wide shot. Everybody's in frame. We got this unique little angle going for just a little bit of aesthetic appeal. And then, you know, the cinematographer comes in and is just like, oh, but if we put it on tracks and panned around this way and then lifted and it's like, holy moly, how did that even, that kind of creativity is, I admire that. But, you know, you have that in all of the roles, whether it be a sound, you know, sound tech or a cinematographer, editor, 
director. It's just some people have that magic and what they kind of like you said, that role that you gravitate to and it just clicks for you. Yeah, and also it's, it's that beauty of the relationship as well. So like I, I, there's a lot of cinematographers that I will want to work with for the rest of my life because they get the style I want to go with and we can both click and make what we need to do for the screen. But then sometimes it's nice to go, okay, well, this person's going to give it a different look because you're looking for the best in their in their skill it's, and to make sure the relationship can work with each other. Absolutely. And I like someone who can... I don't have to repeat myself in like five different ways to be on that same wavelength. I like someone who has that relationship that understands kind of where my mind is. Mm. And that's a scary place to be, but... <laughs> But those who can kind of speak a similar language, it doesn't have to be the same language, but just a similar language so that working on the set has that ease. No, I completely agree with you. And like you said, it it, it, it applies to all components, the same with, with an editor relationship to, uh -huh. yeah, even even sound, lighting, whatever whatever you need on the set, of course. Well, you need all those elements Absolutely. on the set, of course, but... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I could do without sound. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how every sound person feels on set when they always, every sound person always complains about always being the spare component there because they're going to do the job <laughs> and they're going to do it perfectly, but you, you, you know, you can't see the sound, can you? But um, yeah, sorry, I just kind of drifted off then. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, talking to us and um, I'm really looking forward to working on the projects that you and I have got in the future. I just didn't want to talk too much about them now, Absolutely. of course, because there's hundreds of things going on. I, no, I understand. And I love seeing all the projects that you guys have going on. And I try to jump on to the different watch parties where I can. I know the time difference kind of throws us off a bit, but mm. I do enjoy what... I enjoy watching people's creativity. Like storytelling is one of my favorite things and seeing other people embrace it is just and execute it and be excited about it is just, it gets me, you know, excited and inspired to do it myself and to keep doing it. You know, we all get to a point where we burn out a little or question ourselves a little. So then when I see people like you and your team and others out there that are super excited about their projects, it just reminds me of that love and passion for storytelling in myself. So it's, it's really nice. I completely agree with you. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll put a link at the bottom for uh, the website so people know how to check out the Extra Script competition and any future trap film festivals. And I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for that, Sam. Really good interview. So, guys, as it is the penultimate episode, um, next week's one we will be in August, but we've got something else lined up for you guys. So this week we decided to focus on our monthly horror um, talk. So this week we decided to do it around zombies and um, well whenever I think about zombies first kind of zombie film that strikes me is the is it Dawn of the Dead the original 70s one and they're based in the mall yeah, yeah. sort of like Romero's classics yeah. it's it's kind of um, is it commercialism yeah it's a, it's yeah. a metaphor for, for consumers yeah that's I mean, it he, apparently Romero claims that he, he didn't he that he wasn't making a statement about consumerism but in like Romero has a habit of doing this yeah. because like he did it with the, with the first film because uh, if you've seen um, the if you've seen the night of uh, is it the night of the living dead night is that the, the one dead. yeah that's it night of the living dead um in the at the end of that film you've you've spent the whole film with this uh, black protagonist who is a powerful like uh, really affirming character um, like he's, he's the hero of the of the piece which is very unusual for the for the time um, but at the end uh, when he survived all of this he's just shot by these uh, white blokes who's just going around shooting zombies randomly and he's just killed uh, and that's the end of the film that, and, and it's so such a poignant Leaves a brutal hole. moment that really like sheds a light on the politics, but 
But Romero says, well, that was never my intention um, to make that statement. Um, I, I just picked the best actor. Uh, it had nothing to do. And that probably is true. But at the same time, come on, you know that you're yeah, making yeah. a statement. Shows and it's a beautiful, care. brilliant yeah. statement to make. It's yeah. so good. Like, but the same with the um, with the next film, The Dawn of the Dead, because it, it, it's, again, like such a clear statement that you can't avoid. Like the fact that they're just wandering around. What's the, is the, There's a line in it that they say uh, about the about them wandering around because that's what they used to know. Yeah, and and yeah. so they're just drawn to the places that they used to be when they were alive kind of thing. And, and it's, uh, again, such a powerful statement, but apparently unintended. <laughs> As most people know, George A. Romero was, you know, he began zombies. You had before, like, the more voodoo kind of perspective of zombies, mm -hmm. but that direct idea of the dead coming back to life, that's him. That's yeah, did yeah, did yeah, Greg Nicotero work with him? Yeah, he, they worked on um, Day of the Dead, the third one in the right. 80s. Because the, the original zombies were, were much more like... A, 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 the idea was that they were raised by... by um, uh, some like sort of voodoo, yeah, that's it. Voodoo. It was more about being in a trance, wasn't it? From that, yeah, way. yeah. Well, they were brought, they it was still raising the dead that would eat people, but it wouldn't convert, like turn it other people. So it wasn't like an infectious kind of like. Mm. It was more about that, that magical aspect. Yeah, and if you know yeah. anything about a bit of voodoo. That's how they turn people into the undead. And of course, Romero actually they, never they uses the Romero never used. I, I don't know in the later films, but in the early films, so he didn't use the word zombie. Um, that was given to it by sort of people watching, wasn't it? Like rather than... when you're discussing like the magic element, I just think in Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. ever recall when you got bit by bit by one of them that you turn into a dog or something. Like, <laughs> so... <laughs> I think that's the interesting thing with Romero. Like all his zombie films, they're they're, they're social horror. They're about mm. what's going on at the time. Obviously, in the '60s, when you start with Night of the Living Dead. Firstly, no one had ever seen anything like that. No. Yeah. And they accidentally played it during matinees for kids, which I'm always going to remember. <laughs> it's hilarious. But it was and about the, the nuclear missile crisis with Cuba and that idea of what would happen if there was something like that could occur. And it was truly, like, horrendous. I mean, you like, the, the, the moment where you've got that child who, who gets turned and, and eats, <laughs> eats their mother... And it's just like that moment of, uh, it's just really like, yeah, it's, it stays with you. It's very, very dark uh, psychological horror. It's not just mm. sort of, you know, zombies jumping out at or you. Or visual kind of yeah. effects and stuff. It's yeah. it, it, the it, emotional aspect of it that exactly. impacts you. This is the interesting with Dawn of the Dead because he's playing with consumerism, but he's also playing with the very idea of what an American family is. Because mm. they're sort of forced into that scenario as they're trying to survive. It's less of the the panic of the immediacy of they're trying to come in and more of a, as I said, we are going to just live, live with this. The zombies aren't even as much of a threat. They are, of course, a threat, but Romero's always trying to remind you humans are worse yeah. and their actions are always going to be worse. Yeah, yeah. The the thing that the thing that is most scary about a lot of his films is what the human like the um, Day of the Dead yeah. um, with the with the military <laughs> the the military in that are far more scary than the zombies themselves. The zombies are just sort of there in the background, and what the military are doing and and the way that they're acting is is much more horrifying. Well, someone I saw on Facebook made the point that it's very similar to what's happening right now. In Armageddon times, and it's the military are taking over and the science is rejected right out. The scientists are not the answer. The only answer is to shoot, 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 and kill, 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 not understand and make sure it's not going to happen again. And I think Romero's always bringing that point up. And that whole, like, personally, Day of the Dead's my favourite zombie film. Because as well as all of these fucking great, deeper ideas... Romero brings on the best people possible for special effects. Mm. He gets Tom Savini and like you say, he gets Greg Interio later on. And even when he came back in like 2004 with um, Land of the Dead, which Land of the Dead's like, although I love Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead's his big epic. Yeah. It gets all of his ideas in place and, and they bring a more sympathetic That's the one view. with the compound. Is, is, yeah. yeah, and yeah, the yeah. zombies rise up to get the rich who live up top in the yeah. compounds. Romero's always bringing back those ideas and it's because Romero's a hippie. <laughs> he was, he's always the hippie and he's always looking at it from a more human perspective of like when we get to those primal points we're going to rip each other apart and that's when it will be come back to economics and stuff like that it will be those who can survive and those who are going to just be left to, to die mm. so like <clears throat> give us a sort of an idea of what your favourite 
um, zombie films were in the 80s and the 90s. Because uh, for me, I don't, I can't think of anything that kind of like comes to mind straight off the bat. Well, I can name the, a few in the noddies and stuff. This but. is it, like this is special effects heaven time. So you've got more of um, because zombies have started being become more of a mainstream idea. You get into that kind of right. Let's have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. And the first zombie film that comes to my mind is always Return of the Living Dead. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> they literally proclaim in the opening that Night of the Living Dead is a true story, and it's not. It's not made by the same people at all. But they just it's kind of a homage. Yeah. Well, it is. A, it's almost a homage. It's almost parody. Yeah. Like it, it go, It's it's between it's the two. Very silly. Ridiculous so silly. film. Literally, um, but so much fun as well. Like there's a black kind of monster covered in tar, who literally just goes brains. You know, it's, it's that. <laughs> on the nose. And I think that's what you see. Sounds a lot like of something films. from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You, you get. You, it does work. Comedy and zombies work really well because mm -hmm. of that numbness of their existence and tying it into... You, you know where I'm going with Yeah, this. yeah. <laughs> Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. <laughs> Shaun of the Dead's a perfect reflection of how, like... It is British society <laughs> in, like, 2003, 2004. Mm. There's weird numbness where nothing's too bad. No one's really reacting to anything. They're just going through it. But everything's sort of shit at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, I suppose, in a way... Their reaction would probably be like anyone's reaction is what would you do? Oh, yeah. go to the safest place you know, the pub. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I think that's what Shaun of the Dead does so well is it looks at that human side of the zombie apocalypse, just like Romero did, yeah. but but looks at the funny side of of what humanity can be mm. rather than rather than what human like what can be driven to humanity tearing itself apart. Um, what kind of reminds me of what you're saying is like uh, in the bit where there's a whole herd of zombies between them and the pub and they then like in, well they basically try and become zombies they more well yeah. i'm not getting my words out today they basically pretend that they're zombies and um yeah the, it's kind of like if you follow that culture you'll fit in like yeah, if you become yeah. a sheep then you'll it's fit into society uh, i've never thought about it like that well, it, that's an interesting yeah no that's cool when shawn of the dead came out i think everyone sort of assumed oh it's a british comedy ripoff of dawn of the dead mm. and instead because edgar wright is as we said earlier he's, he's a much better filmmaker mm. he didn't go that way he took it as a structure of dawn of the dead and went i'm going to do this in a british context on a smaller level because it is the same sort of thing escaping to a place to think they're going to survive yeah. But with um, <laughs> just not a supermarket. Yeah, but pe <laughs> people forget though. Like, Shaun of the Dead's really quite vicious because when they do get to the point where they're like, we don't know what to do, we're overtaken by zombies. Everyone loses their shit, and it comes back to that primal thing that zombie films always do, where you just go, it's uh, flight or fight. It, it's mm. that kind of what do I do in this situation? I'm gonna go to most primal like reasoning. Yeah. The, um, which is really interesting when you think of the other side with zombies, with the more recent zombies of the infectious zombies. So in particular, 28 Days Later mm -hmm. and 28 Weeks Later. Those films, they still play on every single principle that you know, but they just bring in that other element where these things are just continuous, so impassioned to just attack. And, they're so, and it's not even just about the speed of them. It's about their very... The aggression. Yeah, it's, it's the franticness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and that sort of um, their eyes. speaks to something slightly different to the, uh, and I feel like, you know, if you if you can sort of compare it to to Romero's earlier zombies that are much slower and sort of dim witted, it's it's almost. Uh, I mean, it, you know, you can see that as opposing, but I feel like it's almost an extension of that because, like, the draw of of sort of the, of what he was talking about in Dawn of the Dead and other films is about how society sort of numbs you out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and. These these later ones are not just numbed out; they're frantic. So when it comes to sort of like that idea of of capitalism and things like that, it, it, it it's more of a push to buy, 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 as opposed to sort of like a numbness. Sort I, yeah, of, I think of, I think as well on that. I know it's twenty eight days later, and the, the outbreak just happens, and then it's them dealing with it and stuff. But it's almost like an evolution. Mm. So what would happen if it was? X amount of years passed, yeah. and the zombies had evolved. Would they become more frantic? Would they, like in, in the same sort of way as would you know the 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 esteemed or whatever change, and you you're still fighting against that? Well, this is where I feel like, in a weird way, you, those ideas work. And if you think think about where we are in the twenty first century, yeah, mm. what is the more uh, voice you hear now? It's the protests. 
And I feel like they're almost like a riot. Because if something's running towards you screaming, you, you either get out of the way of it or you have to take it on as an impact. And I feel like in a weird way, because it was right at the beginning, what was it, like 2001, 2002? So before all of it got to this point, yeah. it was where it was always going to lead. If you keep just being numb to everything, something's going to react. Mm. And there's going to be a reaction and you, it's going to be violent. You either get out of the way or you try and stop it. And it's so infectious in that film. It's just the blood. Mm. Little blood yeah, violence. and and the the like uh, so many of those shots of just <laughs> them running through fields. I was going to say, there's that just, really famous one in there. Yeah, and it's so like, the, yeah, that shot is so. Uh, it just sticks in your mind. Well, you know, so, yeah, you see it, first thing I think is like, like you know, I used to be a long distance runner, but there comes a point where you can't run any longer, mm. and these things have got stamina for days. Mm. Like you're. you're you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. When it comes back to most zombie films, you're always going to that idea that essentially it's going to overtake and there's no outrunning it. Even with Romero's films, mm. they might be slow, but that didn't really matter. There was more of that. It was the power in numbers. Yeah. yeah. And it was the fear because after a while, you can only take so much. You're not going to become the hero in an immediate situation. And I think what 28 Days Later does is exactly the same thing. And it doesn't matter about the speed of the zombies. I'm only bringing this up because apparently lots of zombie geeks have fights about fast or slow, fast or slow. <laughs> it's in context of the creator. Yeah. If it works either way, you know, like too many fast zombies gets a bit silly. Yeah. But <laughs> am I right in thinking that they were in production for I think it was 28 months later? Uh, they've been talking about it since like the last one came out. It's ongoing. Maybe one day. And that's the, that's the other thing with um, 28 Days Later and those more virus zombie films they they some people go well that's more realistic and just like yeah it is but there's something also quite more creepier and sinister about the idea of the dead just rising yeah and coming up and wanting something in back you know mm. um there's the other side like i i, I know i said i wasn't going to talk about this earlier but i'm going to talk about it <laughs> you wait until we're live on air and <laughs> drop a bombshell the other side of zombies is the frankenstein zombie that science has created yeah and of course, the perfect example there is Frankenstein. But me personally, my favourite of that example is Reanimator. Because Reanimator, it, it localises it, and it's obviously an 80s film. And it's actually a Lovecraftian story rather than Frankenstein, but it's that mad scientist who gets the goo, who can then inject the dead and they'll come back to life. So he starts then putting different people together, and the rich university people want it, and then he becomes the head. And, you know, it's just like zombie madness. And I feel like. Um, there's actually a lot of weird freedom in making zombie movies because if you're going to go extreme with gore, it's, it's either going to be dis detestable or hilarious or ridiculous. And the idea of having different body parts of people and then just <laughs> legs running around kicking and stuff, it's, it's a ridiculous kind of concept. Yeah. But science, if it was to go to that point and it's going to be in that sort of environment, it's going to be kind of crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if science ever got to that point, you'd think, why, why are you doing this? Like, yeah, what's, yeah. The, what's the purpose of but these it's, legs running it's that, around? <laughs> it's that interesting point of the madness of the scientist who doesn't particularly want to... Because like, Frankenstein's difference is that yeah. the humanity side of what's left within the Frankenstein's monster, it's about that more, isn't it? Because eventually the humans hunt him down and burn him. So even in like the beginning with Frankenstein, it was always humanity that was worse than the undead thing that's risen. And I think um, it's interesting with nowadays, we, we, we go more for the, the viral kind of thing of it, something that's spread into an evil, that's spread into people, and then they become this unnatural thing, so it takes them away from any sense of humanity whatsoever. Mm. And if we, if we do look at those films, um, I, I, I've recently fallen in love with these films, the Wreck films, which are Spanish um, films. That, uh, they're not zombie films, but they are zombie films, so I get it. We'll mention it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Reluctantly. <laughs> essentially, it's about like there's this uh, film crew who are just filming this firefighter. It's all um, found footage sort of style, but more docu horror. And they go into this um, big old estate and there's something weird's happened. So they've gone in there to sort one thing out and then a strange thing happens and then there's zombies everywhere. And it's so visceral and because it's all like feels like, you, although it is, you know it's documented, but you feel like you're there with them. So the zombies, when they jump on the, the screen and they're like hanging off, you're just like, Jesus Christ. And although the first one was like really effectively creepy and it genuinely scared me. And when you realize at the end, actually this is, this is a demon 
It's not. This is a demon who's possessed these people who then attack others who then come back from dead. So it's kind of like, you know, it's that viral sense again. Yeah. The second one brings it to where a lot of zombie films do tend to go. And even George A. Romero has done it himself. Bringing in action. The second one is about a SWAT team who are basically like going in back into that house. And it literally starts straight after the first film. And you're with the SWAT team. So they've got guns and they've got more like cameras attached to them. So you, you feel like it's a whole different kind of vibe. Mm. And I feel like it makes so much sense that eventually action has to filter through with zombies. Yeah, I think so. Especially when you look at like the early, like even the earlier dead. zombie films. Think of the SWAT have... team scene at the beginning with the SWAT team and all zombies in yeah. the cage and stuff. It's always yeah, got exactly. to be there. You've, you, because, because there's only one way to deal with that kind of thing and that's through violence. But also... I think that when it comes to a, a moment that's sort of tearing apart humanity, what often comes out is that sort of like heroic masculinity kind of like, I can do some violence and that will solve well, things. Unfortunately, um, again, looking at right now, mm. zombies represent uprising. Yeah. And if we look at how during the Black Lives Matters and how the military have been and the police have just been like, give what you want. Mm. It's exactly the same response they would have if there were zombies. Mm. And I feel like that's just the sad state of humanity that we're going to go as militant as possible immediately. Obviously, in a zombie context, you know you don't want yes, the zombies. There's just sort of weird justification for it in a mm. zombie film, but at the same time, it, it does give you sort of grounds to explore that. I think. I think <clears throat> whenever you go into the realms of action, um, and even I suppose in zombie films in general, there is that kind of idea where you make the protagonist the absolute hero and yeah. they come out on top. So what springs to mind is World War Z. Yeah. And I know that that was an adaptation from a book, I believe. Yes. And um, what they should have done or what like I've read into is that, that they kind of went away from what the book does and they went very much for, a, oh, an A-list celebrity and Brad Pitt yeah. and kind of steered away from the, the, um, the main narrative of the book. But then by the end of the film, it's kind of like, well, we kind of got a vaccine here. Like, oh, and it's like, well, in a film, for me personally, I don't like whenever you put something that out there that's like overbearing, there's no like hope in sight, whatever. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Love it. No, 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 I love that. Yeah. But then you undermine it by this little small thing. It's like, yeah. well, no, we've just created a vaccine. Oh, whoa, hippity day. Like, it's interesting though with, with that, because if you know the history of World War Z, uh, it's a film that like fell apart so many times yeah. and they actually did the, the ending like twice. Yeah. So there was an ending which was more towards the grim sort of... They wanted to make a lot of money with that. They mm. wanted to play on the hero idea, taking down the zombies. And again, because zombies are so mainstream nowadays, it's very easy to filter out any political ideas. Yeah. And I think that's where action can sometimes take over where you're right, it brings in the hero concept. And then you sort of forget the fact that this hero is shooting people. They, they might be zombies, but they were human beings. Yeah. And that gets very quickly missed because he's got to go and rescue his daughter or you know something think, like that where he's got to look after the family. If you're going to use zombies, you can either use it in a very simplistic way, like Dawn of the Dead. It's a very mm. simple kind of narrative. You follow it quite easily, and it's still heartbreaking and stuff. Or <clears throat> um, you have a really well-structured story, which brings the zombies element into it in a, in a proper way rather than just having a story and it's like oh yeah there's zombies as well yeah you know like 28 days later it's structured around the zombies and their survival and stuff it's pretty simple like you know mm. kind of what's going on with world war z i felt like they yeah it is around zombies but you lose that impact to a certain degree, because you just focused on the protagonist all the time, you never really see the threats. I think yeah. it's. I think that that's why it's trying to tell more of a an action film, sort yeah. of in in a zombie uh, backdrop, essentially. Um, yeah, but then and I, I never it's saw kind of the film. I never zombies. actually watched the film that because it just seemed like it was too long, and it wouldn't really be for me. It wasn't, it's not even that long. Like as a spectacle to watch, it's a, it's an enjoyable film, mm. but. When you start looking back on it, you can see all the holes. Yeah, I mean, like, I, have strongholds I, and stuff, and the zombies just mount each other at the given point when Brad Pitt's there, and it's like, oh, how do we move the story along? Oh, well, they just mount the wall. This is the thing, and it becomes a CGI just collection of things. And there's a lot of artistry in zombies. Yeah. There's a lot of depth behind what a zombie is, and there's a lot of craft in what you're creating. Well, a zombie is, in a sense, its own character. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. And you can add so much depth to that. Well, this brings me to, I just want to mention him because he is the greatest zombie ever to live. 
It's Bob. Well, not to Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bob from Day of the Dead. Yeah. Bob yeah. Is, an, is an ingenious concept and such a fantastic performance as well. Because essentially in Day of the Dead, the scientist is trying to train the zombie to be human. And it's got this military background, so it already kind of has a bit of a reaction to the military being there. And, it, and Romero, what, the more he made zombie films, the more he started to dissect humanity in a psychological sense of how much would be left within these people. Because mm. even in the fourth one with the guns and the tools, and at first they're just using the tools, and then suddenly they realise that these tools, they've used them before in the past life, and they can use them for their actual use, and that's why they uprise. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that what he does with his zombie films is he works from, he works backwards, of who we are as if we're if we're a zombie, then we're slowly going to go back to human. What are those elements that still make us human, and what the science tries to do in Day of the Dead is control it by feeding them what they actually want because he's a mad scientist, of course. So it's always that contrasting idea of you're never going to get him back to being human, but where do you find the midline? And by the time of Land of the Dead, the midline is to go. You stay down there with the poor people. We'll stay up here. We'll never communicate. It's funny. And then come entertainment as well. Mm. It's funny you say that. I know it's not strictly film, but if you've ever seen Penny Dreadful, they have Frankenstein and his monster, and he does just that. He tries to train him, um, and eventually, over a period of time, the guy starts getting his memories back and yeah. then realizes that he had a wife and child and he died. And it was just, he was the corpse that Frankenstein found. I think there's some elements of that in the original Frankenstein. Not the, the, um, the movie, I mean like in the book and stuff. Mm. Of, of retracing who you actually are. It's kind of heartbreaking. Science. Yeah, the concept of Frankenstein is a heartbreaking story. And that's why like, it has to be discussed when it comes to zombies. Because there is a humanity element. And people easily forget that that was someone who was alive. That's why I'm saying, like, whenever there's a film, the zombie has to be a poignant character within it. There has to be development around yeah. it. Or else they're just there for the sake of moving a story along. It's like the fear factor. They're, they're just a horde in that yeah. respect. Yeah. A horde that you've got to run away from, and that's not a good story. Yeah. I, like, I feel like that, actually, um, about I Am Legend, really, and that's why I don't think it necessarily fits into the zombie mould, because it's not, like... The, although you've got this horde of undead things trying to kill him, um, you don't have sort of much interaction with that. It's no. not a, like it's not really about that. It's more about well, not him until on the his end. Own. Well, I mean, and there's an alternate ending as well, where it's, I think it's like um, well, what they he's wanted. Jesus. He's Jesus, and he's not Jesus. Yeah, well, that's, he that's the, the, the zombie or whatever it was wanted something that he had like in his little container below his house. Um, yeah. Very specific. I feel like <laughs> it's, that time in particular, though, it's just a horde of CGI. Yeah. And that, then it was obviously more, they thought it'd be more effective in that way. Mm. But when you see the same sort of thing over and over again that has no life to it, because I know what, when you play a zombie as an actor, yeah. you've got a bit of fun with that. You want to bring a person. How do you look at me? Because you, you, you start <laughs> to think to yourself, like, well, well how'd they die? How are they going to move? And what we've, when we made our zombie film, The End, we, we had so many different people as zombies and you could say, see that it was an inner dream of theirs and even, even you played a zombie yeah, chat. Yeah. And I remember like even Simon Berry, he was, he was an amazing zombie and there was so much personality to it. And you miss that with CGI zombies. It's yeah. just a horde. And a horde is not scary. It's just sort of like, oh yes, yeah, so they can run to A to B. And yeah, zombies get mistreated like that. Mm. Personality is needed to really remind you that they're fucking human ones. Yeah. So in a nutshell then, what would be your ideal kind of zombie film, Sam? I think a zombie film just needs to, it needs to be saying something. And I think that's the most important part. And it depends what it wants to say, it depends what context. But the fact is the zombies were created to say something. They weren't just there to be the horde. They were there to represent humanity. And I feel like that always gets lost sometimes. And also, I'd prefer to see a practical effects zombie film over a CGI zombie film. Yeah, um, I agree. I know. I think, uh, yeah, every every zombie film needs to make a bigger point about society because that's ultimately what what it is mm. it, it is about society changing into uh, into something <laughs> monstrous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's okay. a little plug for my film. Um, <laughs> if it's going to be called that, I hope it is. Um, 
But um, yeah, I think that's I think that's the most important part of uh, zom- uh, zombie films. But I think it's also to see that humanity falling apart. Yeah. Um, and and not just in in terms of like the physicality of, of the zombies themselves, because obviously you see that physical rotting of the of the bodies that are moved, but also that that thing that makes us. Uh, gives us our humanity which mm. is society and and yeah, yeah. you know being together and community and those kind of things and when people turn away from each other uh, and that sort of like um sharp sort of individualism of like i need to look after number one right now that's when it all kind of falls apart and and in all of the films that the zombie films that i've enjoyed the most that's how it's sort of expressed mm. yeah i'd agree i think <laughs> well my biggest point is just there's if you're going to have a film that includes zombies to make it a zombie film there has to be a clear distinction and development of the zombie characters so again what you were saying sam lack of cgi or less cgi um and a bit more development around their characters because at the end of the day they were someone so why not explore that in a little bit of detail because then it actually creates greater emphasis on the protagonist because they're they're having to deal with it themselves like that was a person and how far would you go to protect your own kind like loosely speaking or your own family let's say um yeah how far would you go so guys hope you enjoyed the podcast this week remember this is our penultimate one meaning that next week the 2nd of august is actually going to be our final podcast of this season we're taking a month or so off um, we're doing a bit of filming and stuff within that time. We've got Senseless that we're filming um, and a few other little things going on. Um, we will be back in September though. But as ever, please leave us a like. Leave us a comment. If there's any zombie films that we didn't mention that you want to comment about, please let us know in the comments. Um, also, subscribe. Check out our website, www.trasharts.co.uk. And as ever, guys, much love. Peace out and thanks for listening. Take care. Trash Arts Takeout.